I already have a video up on this channel detailing the history of NVIDIA GPU Boost. So I won't go into too much detail regarding this technology. But we also have to talk about some of the performance limiters that will be constraining the performance of your graphics card. Like any other semiconductor vendor, NVIDIA employs many tools to govern the health and performance of the GPU at runtime. That includes tools to capture metrics and prevent damage due to out-of-spec behavior. NVIDIA is pretty secretive about the performance limiters. However, they do provide some debug information via the NV API. NV API is NVIDIA's core software development kit that allows direct access to the NVIDIA GPUs and drivers. Applications such as Hardware Info rely on this API to provide us, enthusiasts, with GPU performance information. Let's open Hardware Info and look at the various performance limiters available. The power performance limiter is flagged if the graphics card is using the maximum allowed power consumption. Broadly speaking, there are three ways that modern graphics cards use to impose power consumption limits. First, the GPU can estimate power consumption based on the workload characteristics and the assumed voltage based on the voltage frequency curve. Second, the GPU can rely on the external voltage controllers to report the power consumption to the GPU. Third, a separate hardware circuit is used to directly measure the input power and report it to the GPU. Or, as we'll find out later in this video, it could be a combination of any of these three. The power target on this RTX 3050 is set to its total board power of 130 watt. NVIDIA offers customization, but only between 77 and 112 percent of this target, so up to 145 watt. The thermal performance limiter is flagged if the graphics card is hitting the maximum allowed temperature. The temperature target can also be customized from the default value of 90 degrees Celsius to a minimum of 65 degrees Celsius and a maximum of 90 degrees Celsius. The reliability voltage performance limiter is flagged if the GPU requests the VREL voltage to the voltage controller. The maximum operating voltage performance limiter is flagged if the graphics card allows GPU voltage beyond the reliability voltage and the GPU requests the VMAX voltage to the voltage controller. The GPU voltage can also be customized from 0% to 100%. The GPU voltage in particular deserves our special attention. Since GPU Boost 2.0, NVIDIA defines two voltage limitations for its GPUs, the reliability voltage and the maximum over voltage. The reliability voltage, VREL, is the highest voltage NVIDIA deems safe for use during the product warranted period. The maximum over voltage, VMAX, is the highest voltage NVIDIA allows for the GPU beyond the reliability voltage. While NVIDIA claims this over voltage will impact GPU lifespan, it accepts that board partners and customers may be willing to take that risk. NVIDIA allows board partners to enable the voltage range up to VMAX for their customers in the VBIOS and enable customers to set voltage up to VMAX after acknowledging the risks. The GPU voltage option available in overclocking software represents the scale of overvoltage. 0% means no overvoltage allowed and 100% means maximum overvoltage allowed. For my RTX 3050, the reliability voltage is around 1.081 volt and the maximum over voltage is 1.1 volt. The utilization performance limiter is flagged when all GPU compute resources are currently in use. The SLI GPU boost sync performance limiter is flagged when the GPU boost frequency is limited by multi GPU SLI frequency synchronization. Note that undocumented performance limiters are likely impacting the graphics card's performance. For now, suffice to say that when we are trying to get the maximum performance, our goal is to have the maximum operating frequency when only the utilization performance limiter is flagged. From the stability tests, we know that the following performance limiters are triggered. So for any kind of real world 3D workload, the performance is limited by the maximum allowed power consumption. There are two ways that we can override the power limit of a graphics card, flash a BIOS with a higher power limit or do some physical modifications to the graphics card. The physical modification of a mid-end and high-end NVIDIA graphics card involves shunt modding. A current shunt is a resistor that generates a light, measurable voltage depending on the current flow. This yields a real-time power measurement, which the voltage supervisor IC reports to the GPU. The GPU, in return, 
uses this as one of the inputs for power management. We can tamper with this power monitoring circuit to report less than the actual current flow. The process is straightforward. We simply add one more shunt resistor over the existing one. We try to work around the power limitation. Let's have a look at whether we actually achieve that. In 3D Mark Speedway, we could work around the power limitation by shunt modding. The main performance limiter is the maximum allowed GPU voltage. However, against our expectations, in Fermark, the power performance limiter is still flagged despite shunt modding. We can again rely on the NV API and hardware info to investigate what's going on. I won't go over the details of each line item, but let's compare all rails with NVVDD during the Fermark stress test. As you can see from the comparison, shunt modding effectively lowered the reported input power. However, it did not adjust the two output power metrics. So we can theorize that the output power metrics are causing the power performance limiter to be flagged. There's not that much information available on what this metric is or does, but we can devise a theory. And the theory goes as follows. The output power is a calculated power or estimated power based on the GPU VID for the voltage and the workload characteristics for the current. So our voltage multiplied by our current would give our estimated power. We can put this theory to the test when we get to the GPU voltage modifications. We identified the UPI semiconductor UP9512R as the GPU voltage controller. In the datasheet, we find a typical application circuit where we can trace V out via the DRMOS to the PWM of the voltage controller. In the functional block diagram, we find that the difference between the error amplifier and feedback voltage drives the PWM logic control. If we dig a little bit deeper, we find that the error amplifier is nothing more than the reference input voltage, ref in, with VDROOP adjustment. So we could also say that the difference between the reference input voltage, ref in, and the feedback voltage, FB, drives the PWM control logic. The functional description section provides a more detailed overview of the PWM VID structure, which configures ref in. The VID is, of course, controlled by our GPU and its GPU boost algorithm. We have two options to increase the voltage, offset or fixed. In offset mode, we add a voltage to the GPU VID request. In fixed mode, we ignore the GPU VID request and apply a static voltage. In our case, we must opt for the fixed voltage mode to address the power performance limiter. When you want to adjust the voltage, upon opening the Elmo Labs EV2 software, access the DAC1 section. Open the VF curve editor. Select all VF points. Drag the entire VF curve to the top of the editor. Select all VF points mapped to higher than 2220 MHz. Move them to below 2220 MHz. With all of our additional hardware modifications, the performance improvement is not what we'd expect. Turns out that this RTX 3050 graphics card has more protection mechanisms than any other NVIDIA graphics card I previously overclocked. First, the good news. The only remaining performance limiter is utilization, meaning what prohibits additional performance is only the amount of CUDA cores inside our GPU. We can also check the GPU power reporting in Fermark. We can see that the NVVDD output power is now much lower than before. That tells us we were right to assume this is an estimated power consumption based on the GPU VID and workload characteristics. So if it's not the power limiting the performance, what's going on? Once again, we can rely on hardware info to investigate what is going on. Let's have a look at the GPU clock frequencies during a Fermark workload. As we try to increase the performance through overclocking and removing the power limitations, the GPU effective clock diverges further from the GPU clock. Now, the clocking behavior of the RTX 3050 feels kind of similar like AMD Ryzen CPUs when they're clock stretching, but there's a little bit of a difference. Let's have a look at some data and see if we can make sense of this GPU clock throttling. In this chart, you can see the performance at a given GPU clock when no throttling is present and the performance when the GPU clock is set to two gigahertz, but there's clock throttling. We can see that the performance is closely related to the GPU effective clock. From this chart, we can observe two important things. First, the GPU clock throttling appears to start when the voltage exceeds 1.1 volt. 
It may be a coincidence, but that's also NVIDIA's maximum operating voltage for this RTX 3050. Second, GPU clock throttling is much more aggressive in the heavier 1080p workload than the 720p workload. This gives us a foundation to start develop a theory about what's going on. It appears as if the GPU effective clock is throttled based on how much the effective voltage deviates from the maximum permitted voltage. And the maximum permitted voltage is determined by the GPU energy usage. In other words, the more energy the GPU uses, the lower the maximum permitted voltage and the degree to which the effective GPU voltage deviates from the maximum permitted voltage determines the degree to which the GPU effective clock deviates from the GPU target clock. We can put this theory to the test by expanding our testing. At 1.3 volt, there's no GPU clock throttling at the lowest firmware resolution. However, at 1.3 volt, clock throttling occurs much easier than at any of the other voltage levels. At 1.1 volt, there's barely clock throttling even at the highest measured workload. As to why NVIDIA would devise a technology that reduces the GPU frequency and voltage when there's excessive energy use, the answer is relatively simple. It's GPU health management. All semiconductor companies implement protection mechanisms in their designs. That includes rudimentary technologies like over temperature protection and complex technologies like voltage adaptive operation. The goal is simple to ensure the chip operates at the warranted performance level within the warranted lifetime. Any technology that helps ensure chip lifespan is worth implementing as it can save millions of dollars at the bottom line. The last and most important question is, can we do anything about it? And the short answer is yes, with an XOC BIOS. Extreme overclockers have proven the RTX 30 Ampere GPUs can go well above 1.1 volt with an XOC BIOS. The XOC BIOS likely disables any power management features that govern the GPU health. Unfortunately, there's no such XOC BIOS available for the RTX 3050. So the long answer is that it's unlikely anything we can do about it. Similar to AMD's Precision Boost Overdrive or Intel's OC Mailbox, features that allow for manual tuning of the chip parameters must be enabled by the semiconductor company. Otherwise, there's simply no tuning. Due to an increasing chip complexity and a deeper integration of a wide variety of technologies, it requires more and more effort to enable chip customization. And chip customization includes overclocking, but it's much more than that. Enabling silicon hyper customization to the fullest extent means that the device owner has the means to run the chip they own at whatever voltage and frequency they choose. Whether that means running the GPU clock as high as possible for maximum performance, as low as possible to maximize power savings, or somewhere in between to maximize performance per watt. With this RTX 3050, I feel that despite having paid for the chip and being more than willing to give up any warranty claims and having no problems risking my GPU health, the semiconductor vendor, Nvidia in this case, is still telling me what I can and cannot do on my own system. That doesn't feel quite right.